from um, uh, Sweden. Uh, I just got here, so I'm still a little bit rattled by the whole trip. But thank you for sending a lot of interesting questions. <laughs> And we'll just um, see how far we all get. Um, so I've got a lot of questions about shamanism this time. So I'll just start with the first one. I'll post it here. So the question is about the shamanic um, cosmology, the division in the three levels of worlds. The highest world, the middle world, and the uh, lowest world. Um, and the question is, if we are tuning to an egregore, do we transfer ourselves into the higher world in accordance with the shamanic tradition or somewhere else? Do energies of Hermes reside in the highest world? Um, and there's a little footnote, I'm confused by the feeling of power, of being powerful which arises when he is present. And the secondary question is, does regularly going to these worlds, uh, tuning into an egregore once a week, help spiritual development of a person, or is it just energetical exercising? Um, so the first thing is indeed that um, uh, egregores uh, generally reside mainly in the higher world, but they do have some manifestations in the middle world, but usually not so much in the lower world. So if you go into the lower world, you can see like the unconscious messages uh, or the unconscious links to egregores you have from your previous incarnations or the dream messages which they've sent to you, which you have forgotten. So you can go into your own subconscious to reclaim something from the underworld but usually you won't find the egregore there really. Um, in the middle world you generally don't find the egregore unless you're in a place where the egregore's energy has been very powerful or has been very active. Um, so if you go to a place where the egregore has had a school or where it has been founded or where a great master lived of that egregore then that energy of the egregore can be found in the middle world. But otherwise, you will have to indeed go to the higher world to attune to the energy of the Equicore. Um, it depends a little bit also on the quality of the energies which are in the Equicore. Uh, most Equicores are spiritual Equicores, so they are very much related to the higher world, higher powers, higher principles. Um, but some Equicores uh, contain um, yeah, not so nice things. Uh, some egregores are for a large part composed of uh, wandering spirits, uh, enslaved spirits, um, uh, earthbound spirits. So these are not very nice egregores to visit. These are also not egregores which are part of the light cosmos. But these egregores are indeed mainly in the, in the middle and lower world. But let's just not, uh, not go there. Um, so yeah. All the egregores worth visiting are uh, generally in the higher world. Um, so do the energies of Hermes reside in the higher world? Yes, they do. Um, he is one of the, the, the yeah, great masters and uh, similarly to the, yeah, to the other masters, to the uh, deities, uh, to the saints and all other powers whose job it is to guide uh, beings of the middle world, they tend to reside in the higher world. So with Hermes this is definitely true. Um, and um, you also mentioned the, the feeling of being powerful which arises uh, when you're attuning to Hermes or making an invocation or supplication to Hermes. Um, what happens when we, uh, when we attune is that we try to relate our own uh, selves to our source again. So if all is well, we have been initiated in, into that egregore or we have naturally some uh, inspirations which, align, which help us to align with that egregore. 
at the moment we uh, do an invocation and we invite the energy of the egregore to come to the place where we are um, then that invocation, the energy which is coming into the space um, should also resonate with our own inner energies so our inner yeah, power should awaken and depending on the qualities of your inner power how much um, you've worked on liberating it or how much you've worked on becoming conscious of it um, that also um, yeah, responds a little bit to the experience you have when you do the invocation to the egregore so for instance if I have no link whatsoever to a certain egregore or to a certain principle then calling upon that egregore will have no result upon me whatsoever I will not even notice a, a lot going on because there will be no resonance um, if I have a link to an egregore but it has not been activated in this life or yeah, it is just a beginning link, I have some ideals or some principles I would like which correspond to that egregore. I will notice some stimulation, uh, some associations will come forward, some thoughts may come forward, um, or some blockages might become awakened. I might feel like, gosh, this is a waste of time, this is an irritating egregore, or... Um, yeah, some other blocking forces will show themselves in response to the energy which is trying to activate, to awaken. And uh, so this response can basically be an uh, indication of your inner enmity um, between you and uh, the Egregore's energy. Uh, or it may just show that in this current incarnation it is not yeah, your path. Um, so that brings us to the next part, does regularly going to these worlds or, or tuning into the egregore once a week uh, help in spiritual development? Um, there is a slight difference here um, because you can indeed uh, go on a trance journey where you indeed journey into the higher world and try to find the energy of the egregore and uh, this is indeed an energetic exercise of uh, uh, increasing the vibration of your energy body and learning to control the lower vibrations in your energy body so you're no longer bound to the physical world but can rise up into the higher world um, and such exercises are generally good because they increase the quality of the energy body and eventually also allow you to go higher within the egregore and to attune to the higher levels of the egregore instead of only to the lower levels of the egregore and to find the also higher egregores which have higher vibrations so astral traveling to egregores I would yeah, highly recommend as a spiritual practice um, it is very different to do the typical attunement uh, the typical attunement is actually an invocation um, so you are using uh, your link to the egregore and uh, you're in a way using also your authority as a part or member of the egregore to uh, call upon the egregore to perform its duty its task of inspiring the incarnated people and thereby guiding the, sp the spiritual development upon our planet so uh, an invocation uh, ideally should only be done by an initiate so invoking an egregore which you are not a part of uh, can be um, can have karmic repercussions because you're in a way claiming a power and in a way trying to use your willpower to force something to happen the egregore to manifest itself in the space you're in and if you do not have that authority um, then yeah karmatically it can be bad for you so when you're doing invocations it is best to do invocations to egregores you're either initiated in or you feel there's a lot of kinship with and then you can try to call upon this egregore to invite it and if you feel like okay it's not working then try to respect also uh, the will of the egregore which feels that maybe it is not good to appear in that space um, especially if you're with a group if some people are members of rival egregores then an egregore might not want to uh, make itself more vulnerable by opening itself up to its enemies. 
Um, so also yeah, doing in yeah invocations to egregores, it is best to do it only with the group who at least are more aligned with the light cosmos than the dark cosmos. That would be very um, wise <laughs> because also if you invite the egregore and yeah, one of the other people who's in the space uses the invitation to harm that egregore or to spy on it or invade it then also that will have karmic repercussions on you for being well a, a trusting fool <laughs> um, so that can also be a very interesting spiritual exercise but it's not a very wise spiritual exercise to just invoke egregores randomly <laughs> um, so the calling upon um, uh, an egregore itself, um, the invocation itself is not so much a spiritual exercise. And you are uh, using the authority which you already possess or already are given. Um, getting to the point where you can successfully invoke an egregore, that is a spiritual exercise. So um, taking initiation uh, in opens you up to higher vibrations and to higher inspiration so that is part of spiritual development the uh, supplication so um, if there is an invocation um, to try to attune yourself to the uh, energies of the egregore to uh, allow the egregore to shape you to inspire you to move you so that you uh, become transformed and inspired by its presence that is also a spiritual exercise. Doing the invocation itself is not a spiritual exercise. Um, also, the, uh, to benefit from the invocation, uh, you need good conditions. Uh, because if your own life energy is blocked or too low, then even though these higher energies come in to guide and inspire you, you won't have the ability to transform your own energy body or to learn or to benefit from the lesson and then you're in a way just wasting their time and energy as well as your own um, so you should really have enough energetic quality when you uh, do these or attend to these uh, invocations of an egregore um, similarly some people say like you should not invoke an egregore if uh, you're drunk or you've just eaten or uh, there are some other things going on um, it is indeed true that these are suboptimal conditions the best conditions are usually uh, in twilight and usually the morning twilight is better than the evening twilight uh, because there's a lot more life force present and the uh, energy body is still attuned to the dream state so you can easily go into uh, that vibration and receive inspiration for that day. Uh, it's also nice to do it indeed in the evening before you go to sleep because sometimes you can take some of the vibration which you get from the egregore into your energy body which helps your energy body uh, to go to that egregore in your dreams. So those can be an interesting energetic exercise as you can do with your, uh, with your egregore. Um, so as to tuning in, um, personally I'm in favor of not combining um, too many egregores in one exercise. Some people like to tune into like four egregores in one session and um, it is possible to indeed simultaneously tune into several egregores. For most people it's already quite hard to uh, change their energy body enough to really become attuned with one egregore and to go deeply into the higher vibrations of that egregore and while you're still like on the threshold of that egregore then switching again to another egregore that prevents you from going more deeply and I think it's far more valuable to go deeply into one egregore than to go and to just hit the surface of a lot of egregores. Um, as to exercise I would also um, yeah, advise people to uh, not switch egregores too frequently. Uh, an egregore yeah, has a certain path it can guide you on and you should first in a way receive uh, a guidance or a quest from that egregore then you should fulfill that quest <coughs> I'm sorry and once you've done with that 
yeah, part of your transformation, uh, then you can yeah attune to another egregore to move into another quest. So I would advise people to stay attuned to the same egregore until your quest has been completed. <coughs> so the important thing is also how you use the egregore because I noticed that many people um, mainly want to benefit from egregores instead of to work for egregores and this is not the yeah the primary purpose of an egregore so there are many schools many masters which is great because these schools and these masters and these teachers will help you in spiritual development an egregore's purpose is to shape the world uh, it is therefore very much uh, busy with creating conditions creating schools and uh, changing society so that their method of spiritual development will be reflected, their ideals will be reflected in the lives of people. Uh, but it is very much uh, looking for active members. Um, and as a member of an, of an egregore, you are more of a doer than uh, merely, merely a student. So an egregore always has a kind of an agenda, things they want to, to get done. And if you want to progress in your contact with that egregore, uh, you need to work for it. And there's generally a few stages. Uh, so the first stage is basically you get uh, to learn a little bit about the structure of the egregore, uh, the teachings, uh, how to look at the world, how to think about things, uh, just to get the egregore's perspective on the world. So this is very much a student phase. Um, after the student phase, um, you are uh, yes, supposed to start applying it on yourself. So you start, you should start working on yourself, um, learning in the way of the egregore, and thereby transforming your energy body to become more and more attuned to that egregore. And without this process of, in a way, becoming more and more an embodiment of the egregore, you will not be able to become an agent of that egregore because only once your attunement to that egregore is strong enough then you can act in the name of the egregore and the powers of the egregore will help you in your actions and it's only when you become really an agent of the egregore and start yeah, yeah, doing things for the egregore which the egregore wants done that you really start progressing into the higher layers of that egregore because first you're just like a low-level civil servant, just carrying out orders, filling in the forms, doing the papers, and slowly you will progress, and more and more yeah, other members of the egregore and other powers will become available to you as you make, in a way, promotion within the structure of that egregore. And once you start working with an egregore in that way, not just doing an attunement, but actually start accepting missions and accepting quests uh, and doing your homework assignments uh, then it will indeed be a, uh, a spiritual exercise and you can of course yeah um, once you have an assignment go back to ask for support ask for help ask for advice uh, to that egregore quite regularly uh, while you're working but uh, ultimately your progress is due to how much you have learned and how much you are able to do and if you're yeah, constantly asking for help and trying to get the egregore to do everything for you your progress will be slow so you should try to do as much as you can and ask the egregore to help you with what you can't and thereby you will slowly but surely become a more and more competent user of uh, your own energies and a more and more valuable member of the egregore So I'm now jumping a little bit to um, another question I received. I'll post it. Um, this is a question in three parts. So the question is about the Arthurian legends and also its non-Christian aspects and specifically on Merlin uh, and Morgana or Morgan Le Fay and earth magic. 
because this is also, of course also an egregore and a quite interesting and powerful egregore. So I will start with the last part because it's actually the essence of the egregore, earth magic. Um, <clears throat> so these members of the egregore felt that uh, it was quite hard for people to make spiritual progress on the earth and yeah people were very much prone to falling yeah, to the lower vibrations to their angers to their instincts to their emotions and humanity was not developing very well um, so they uh, felt that by um, changing the energy of the earth um, it would um, also elevate the vibrations of the beings living on the earth so they started to create uh, the, uh, the ley lines and various other networks of energy which can be used to communicate with each other over distances, have telepathic contacts, also to send and transfer energies for different holy places to share energies, to uh, make much more powerful rituals if they're done in several places at the same time. Um, and also to create places where energies are much more concentrated because the natural state of earth energy is rather yeah, chaotic. There's a little bit of everything everywhere. And uh, the first workers of earth magic started to um, yeah, create spaces where they're, yeah, which would be very much open to higher worlds, to higher impulses, to cosmic impulses, to impulses from specific star systems or even uh, specific egregores. Um, they started to create places where there's a lot of life energy, where you can transform things. They started to create energetic libraries, where knowledge of past civilizations, past cultures can be retained and re-accessed. And also where people who die can store also parts of their energy bodies, so that they can be re-implanted in next generation, so that powers and talents don't get lost. So Earth Magic is a quite yeah, big uh, part of um, yeah of what has been done for uh, on an aggregorial level, and this has been yeah a worldwide process um, where people uh, where members of these aggregors have been working in uh, yeah in transforming the energy of the earth and um, yeah creating spaces where there's a lot of energy available for yeah increased spiritual growth. Unfortunately, the Earth Network is being rather dismantled by, well, rather silly and stupid actions uh, and also by some deliberate actions. <coughs> but um, that brings us to the other parts, namely indeed to the pre-Christian parts, because um, it was also recognized that the Earth is in a way what is feeding us, is feeding our energy bodies, is our mother. And in pre-Christian times, people uh, were very uh, yeah, attuned to the energy of the earth, what are good places to live, what are places to build houses, places to build roads, places to build hospitals, places to bury people. And usually um, their sensitivity to the energy of the place allowed people to do things in such a way that they benefited from the energy of the earth. And now we do people in yeah, ways which are planned, um, yeah, rather mentally, uh, which where we often develop activities which are not in correspondence with the energy of the earth and therefore are hindered and don't reach a very high level, um, yeah, at least on, a, on an energetic level. Um, the earth is, however, responsive, so if we build a university in a wrong place, then eventually the earth will adjust to what we're doing there and try to open up a portal so people can yeah, receive inspiration there and can develop there even though the place might not yeah, in the beginning be very suitable for that. And there is a bit of a time lag though, so it generally takes about 40 years for the earth to adjust to what we're doing in a certain place if the earth energy is healthy enough to begin with. If the earth energy is very unhealthy or very weak in an the area there's not much that can be done. So, and that brings us indeed to um, the two main figures of um, 
Merlin and Morgana. Um, Merlin and Morgana are basically also um, showing uh, different traditions. Um, the older tradition is manifested by Morgana. Uh, she's also called uh, Le Fay. The Fay, uh, the Fay are basically um, uh, spirits of uh, of nature. So elves, trolls, giants, dwarves, uh, nymphs, they're all Fay. Uh, the Fay are uh, not generally regarded as uh, beneficial beings. But they're rather regarded as a separate people who have their good sides and their bad sides. <coughs> so it is, um, in a way, uh, Morgana is, in a way, the personification of the nature, which is separate from humanity. Nature, which has just taken care of itself, it has its own processes, its own rhythms of disease, life, death. And if you know these rhythms, you know these powers, they can be allies to you. But if you do not do not respect these powers, they can be your enemies. And this is basically also the, the foundation of all the fairy tales. Like, be good, respect the powers, act in a good way, and they will help you right back. And if you're naughty and nasty and disrespectful, yeah, they can create problems for you. Until you learn, because ultimately nature is also our teacher uh, and they're here to support us they're not here actively to harm us so this is very much the role of Morgana and the role of Merlin is basically um, uh, indicative of the of the later influences also um, there are uh, Welsh and Celtic legends about the birth of Merlin but in most stories he's more shown as um, uh, Germanic influence. So when um, the Nordic and the uh, uh, Germanic influence came to uh, the British Isles and also to uh, yeah, the Celtic regions of uh, Belgium and France, it brought with it also a different type of spirituality. A spirituality which was not focused on nature itself, but rather on the human path of development. So it starts to be about human traits like honesty, uh, perseverance, uh, morality, uh, masculinity, femininity, um, gods, principles, heroes, sagas. Um, and all these powers are more or less um, shown as a different spiritual path, which is in a way existing alongside the spiritual path which is being promoted by Morgana but uh, the, of course the new tradition which is more focused on humans is starting to replace and therefore has a competition with the old tradition which is focused on nature itself and humans being just a part of it just like the animal instead of having a separate role in it as in a way the Arthurian and uh, Merlin uh, would uh, state there's also um, a Celtic uh, a myth, a Welsh myth, about the birth of Merlin, which uh, uh, yeah, puts a rather more uh, Celtic twist on it, uh, with uh, uh, Merlin actually having been one of the helpers of uh, Siritwen, uh, the earth goddess, who accidentally uh, uh, yeah, got some of the powers which the goddess meant to give to her son. and. Um, he was then um, yeah, uh, uh, placed as, uh, yeah, he died and in a way reincarnated uh, out of the earth goddess and uh, was then uh, adopted by either the king of the elves or the king of the dwarves. Um, stories differ a little bit. Uh, who taught yeah, uh, Merlin and then later Merlin yeah, became of course the planner and advisor of um, uh, of Arthur but then we get to the very interesting role of Arthur <coughs> which is also very different depending on traditions um, so one of the stories is indeed that yeah Arthur was a more Welsh or Celtic hero uh, trying to heal the land and to repel the influence of the Nordic and Germanic tribes. 
the more yeah, common version is that actually Arthur was of the Nordic and uh, or Germanic tribes and was thereby um, yeah, uh, quelling the, 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 yeah, the old religion of the, of the Celts. And the later version of, uh, uh, of course, Arthur and Merlin were that they were Christian and they were fighting against the, the pagans. So both against the, the, the Nordic tradition and against the Celtic tradition. So it depends very much on what time frame you're looking at, um, who exactly they are. So, and the, the Arthurian uh, sagas, they're quite old, so they probably started already in Celtic times and then they were adopted by the um, invading uh, Germans and Scandinavians and then they were kind of revived in the uh, 14th century um, yeah, by, the, by the Christians, or actually not so much revived, but they started to spread in a Christian coat. Um, so that makes Merlin a rather difficult person or difficult egregore to work with, but um, Merlin himself or the energy of Merlin is definitely part of an egregore. Um, it's an egregore which is no longer really active on the earth, but what I've uh, seen from people who have worked a lot with the energy, who have channeled Merlin, and uh, from my own little investigations into this egregore, I would say that Merlin's influence or egregore is really a Nordic one. So it is really focused on the yeah, Nordic tradition and the, uh, where you had basically two races of gods, the Vanir, the gods of nature, the Aesir, the gods of the humans, who cooperated in ruling the world. So Merlin is very much um, yeah, as an egregore also stands for respecting and working together with the gods of nature but also knowing that you are a human and that you can uh, have an extra part to play as a human so that you should also rise above just the path which is available in nature and evolve to a higher level. And this is basically what Merlin is all about. It's about learning people how to yeah, respect the earth, respect the existing powers, um, but also not be limited by them and be really open to the endless possibilities which you have as a human, eventually evolving to other star systems and uh, becoming part of different yeah, houses of different deities, different gods. And time-wise he's of course part of the harmonic age, the harmonic influence which was uh, trying to teach humans to deal with all their powers, all their impulses, love, war, hunting, nature, protection, trade. Um, and so in that they're very much a pre-hermetic and pre-Christian influence. Uh, although they are, yeah, have been cast in a Christian guise in later myths. Um, so yes, about the, the Arthurian legends, uh, the Arthurian legends also has the different heroes um, and every hero is in a way also very much corresponding to a certain uh, path of development, a certain quality which you, can, uh, which you can work on or a certain sin, depending on how you see the heroes because they all have their qualities but they also have their weak, weak points. And um, in this aspect also the Arthurian tradition was already very much influenced by the Nordic influence. Uh, so it's not a purely Celtic uh, tradition if you look at the Arthurian tradition. Um, it probably dates back from just after the Roman times or late Roman times it is thought. So and also in the late Roman times the Germanic influence became very strong within the remnants of the Roman Empire. Okay, so I'll pause for a moment for questions because I've been rattling on. <laughs> okay, I don't see any questions being forthcoming. 
Um, I guess this is also a very nice question. So a shaman in Latvia says that it is not good to pray for other people because in such a way we intervene in the necessary state of affairs and we make obstacles to natural spiritual development of the person. What do I think of this statement? Um, well, if you uh, uh, look at indeed the roots of shamanism, which are all about uh, power and your spirit which should become powerful enough that it is not distracted or diverted from its path, then the shaman is completely and perfectly right. Because this is also why the shamanic tradition was founded, to teach people to have the strength to do that. But um, also within the shamanic tradition, <clears throat> we do need teachers, we do need examples. And it is very accepted within shamanic tradition that a plant or an animal or another person can help you. But it is very much the duty of the person who has the problem to try to find it. And if he is somehow incapable of doing that, then the shaman has to help him find it or to find it for that person. So for instance, if there is a, a person who is coming for a shamanic session, and um, they need help from an animal spirit and they cannot find that power animal then it is my duty as a shaman to try to find that power animal and either to lead the person to the power animal to connect them somehow or to allow the power animal to enter into my body so it can guide that person through my body so uh, of course the best progress is made if you solve your own problems but leaving a person to their fate is, well, more of a dark side than a light side, I would say. Uh, praying itself is indeed um, uh, it can be done in a very shamanic way. Uh, you can uh, attune yourself to different power animals or to different plants or to different nature spirits the same way as you can attune yourself to a saint or an egregore. Um, but within shamanism, often the, um, the trance journeying and the ability to yeah, alter and change your energy body so you become attuned to another world is used more than prayer. Um, because it is very much about learning to use your own energy body, getting self-control, developing self-control. And therefore it is not promoted to, yeah, to pray too much. Uh, only if your energetic nature is such that yeah, you have to pray or praying is your path, then you pray. But if you are able to yeah, control your own energy body, you should do that. Because it is very much, uh, yeah, power is very much about discipline, it's very much about warriorship. So yeah, the shamanic way yeah, would be that. Um, if you progress a little bit spiritually and if you're no longer a pure shaman, but go into the paganistic uh, yeah, tradition, which is yeah, still linked to shamanism, uh, then it depends very much on what deities you are attuned to. Because then it's not so much the power animal or the, the tree or the bush or the stone is the teacher, but rather the deity is the teacher. And as soon as it comes to deities, then prayer becomes actually much more useful. Um, because you can change your energy body to become like a bear or a kangaroo or uh, a platypus. Uh, it is within your capability as a human being. And by altering your energy body in such a way you can yeah, gain the powers of that animal and thereby overcome difficulties. Uh, you are not able to change your energy body into that of a god or a goddess. Um, so it is the yeah, ability to transform the energy body to the trans journeying is less useful when you're moving into paganism and then prayer is the right path because 
you have to uh, learn more how to use your power than rather than how to get your power. Shamanism is about getting power, paganism is about using it in the right way. Um, so if that is the case, then the person should pray. Um, let me get to another thing, indeed praying for others. Um, praying for others is something which enters much later in traditions. Because in paganistic tradition it is about you accepting that you're imperfect and you need to study at the feet of a god or a goddess. So the person who has the problem should pray, not somebody else should pray for them. Um, if they have a very bad relationship with the god or goddess or cannot make contact or something else, then they should go to a priest or a priestess who will pray for them. But another yeah, uh, lay person is usually not the one who is doing the praying. Well, if you move into the hermetic tradition, well, praying is not so much a part of the, of the tradition. It is more about rituals and how to use rituals and invocations and symbols. But if you move onward towards the yeah, um, um, Buddhistic and Christian traditions, then it becomes about compassion. And as soon as you feel, gosh, I'm on the path of compassion, this is actually the level of I am at, then you should pray. It is your duty to pray and to do whatever you can for the other person. Because you have to do what you can do to alleviate other people's suffering, to save them from themselves and save them from all the limitations, to yeah, increase their spiritual development. And if it is not possible for you to improve their spiritual development, uh, but it is possible for a higher being to do so, an angel, a god, a goddess, an enlightened master, um, then you can yeah, ask on behalf of that person, if that person grants you authority, and this is a very important one, um, to, for that power and ask it to intervene in that person's life. If you ask that person to intervene without the authority, then you're meddling. Then you're indeed disturbing that person's karma, that person's path, um, because the person's essence has not given you permission. And now we come to another part. Who is the authority which is giving the permission? Should it be the ego or should it be the spirit who gives the authority? Well. Opinions differ. Ideally, both the ego and the spirit should give authority. If the spirit does not give authority, do not pray, because then the person wants to suffer, the person wants to go through a process, it wants to sort it out by itself. Uh, so, if the spirit is not willing, don't pray. <laughs> Find another way. Um, if the spirit is willing, but the ego is not willing, I would personally say, listen to the higher, not to the lower, and pray for that person. Uh, but whether you pray or not, it is still your duty to do as much as you can for the other person to help. And whether that means praying or not, it depends. But as I said, uh, whether you should pray or not is very much dependent also on the path you are following, which Messiah is guiding you and what stage you are in in your own spiritual development. So I wouldn't say in general that there is a best way to help somebody else. Um, about obstacles. Um, praying can also result in obstacles. Um, Ultimately, if you, if you pray, you're requesting for a blessing, and a blessing is literally guidance. Um, I remember one time when I asked um, a spiritual master for, indeed, his blessing on my journey, and um, I had a rather disastrous turn of events. I got no money, I was stuck in a place, I could not get home, and I ended up begging in the streets. And I am sure it was due to his guidance. And without his guidance, I would not have received many very interesting and beautiful spiritual lessons. And I would not have made such an yeah, incredible leap in spiritual development. But at the time, of course, I was 
yeah, meeting a lot of obstacles, having no money, having no food, having no water, having no shelter. And um, then you learn a lot about um, how the lower powers and the higher powers start to compete. Like maybe I should steal, maybe I should lie, maybe I should... And all these lower powers try to overcome the spirit. So obstacles can be very interesting. And ultimately it doesn't matter whether you success, you're successful in overcoming the obstacle or fail at overcoming the obstacle. By having this experience you will have grown spiritually. And so obstacles are also very much part of a blessing. And prayer can indeed lead to yeah, obstacles and interesting uh, challenges. So that doesn't mean that you fail if the person's... Oops. Okay, I see Skype has died. Um, I'll pause for a moment while I try to restart. <laughs> 